And welcome to another Hank Unplugged podcast, the podcast that is committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, inspirational people directly to your earbuds. And today I have another treat. My son, David, always finds these incredible gems for me, uh, books that I read and then become excited about giving to people that have followed our ministry for so many different years uh, in, the, in the course of time. Uh, this book uh, that I want to talk about today is, is really about fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. And this is the very thing that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. When we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we're talking about not a sermon, but the sermon. And right in the middle of that sermon. Jesus says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. Because if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And by the way, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, because they love to disfigure their faces to show men that they're fasting. Instead, when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so it will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So here, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives us what my guest today calls a three-legged stool that is axiomatic for living the Christian life. And that's what we're going to talk about on today's Hank Unplugged. My guest is Father Evan Armitas. He is a parish priest in Colorado, and he has now served at this parish for some 18 years. What's really interesting for me as I read through Father Evan's bio is that he founded the St. Nectarius Educational Fund. I go to St. Nectarius. (laughs) <laughs> That's our church. And I have uh, gone to Agana and I have been to the monastery. In fact, I completed my healing from cancer mm. at that monastery. But he founded the St. Nectarius Education Fund. It's a nonprofit student education program. And that fund has been responsible for establishing five schools in Africa, educating more than five thousand students. That's a big number. Father Evan and his wife, Presbytera Anastasia, are the happy parents 
I love that. <laughs> Happy parents of four children. And he, of course, is the author of the book that we're featuring on the podcast today, Toolkit for Spiritual Growth. It is a practical guide to prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And what's interesting about this book is Father Evan says, I'm not bringing anything new to the table, although for me, he did bring a lot of new things to the table. Uh, But what I'm doing is I'm writing with insights that have been garnered as a parish priest. Mm -hmm. Uh, With with that, I want to introduce my very special guest, Father Evan Armistas, and uh, and, and, and want to thank you at the very outset for writing this book, because it's one of those books that's very accessible, but it deals with, as you have correctly said, a three-legged stool that is axiomatic mm-hmm. for living life uh, in, in, in the sense of union with God. Right. Absolutely. Well, Hank, it's a pleasure to be with you, and thanks for the beautiful introduction. And as you were reading those scriptures, I was following along. And uh, I can remember as a young man uh, reading in my first Bible, the Sermon on the Mount, and being almost struck uh, to the point of wonder at what Jesus was saying, and then making the connection to the spiritual life that I had grown up in in the church. And I can tell you time and again that when I meet people who've either grown up in faith with our Lord or people who are new, to our loving Lord and are building a relationship with him, you constantly come up against the fact that they may have started this relationship or been living in the church, but they are in a sense unsure of what to do (laughs) in terms of how to live that relationship. And so it just seemed obvious to me that we've got to write a book about these simple, but as you placed it, axiomatic spiritual disciplines, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, they are the basis of Christian walk and Christian life, right? And uh, and our Lord talks about them straight out in his most famous sermon, right? Yeah, and, and it seems as though beginning with prayer might lose our audience because the <laughs> average person will say, look, I know everything there is to know about prayer. I pray right. all the time. Right. Or maybe some people are thinking, you know, I'm remiss in not praying all the time, but I, I, I get it. I, I know where I'm supposed to pray. But mm-hmm. prayer is a many-faceted discipline. Mm-hmm. So you start, just as Jesus did, with, with, with prayer. Um, uh, well, I guess Jesus starts with uh, when you give to the needy, and then, then he gets mm-hmm. into prayer. But in your book, chapter one, you start with the purpose of the prayer life. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Expand on that. What is the purpose of our prayer life? Well, I mean, obviously, the first purpose is to place us into a connection directly with God, right? And to be near our Lord and have uh, develop a, a dialogue, right, with Jesus, with the Father, with the Holy Spirit. And certainly, as we know in the church, you know, prayer encompasses all three persons of the Trinity. We don't ignore one or the other. We know that prayer is always an act of communing with a God who lives in community, right? But its purpose is to draw us into the right relationship with God. Um, So in having that dialogue with God and having that active, and as you kind of put it, multifaceted aspect of our spiritual life, because prayer is not just, you know, sort of singular in its act. Uh, I think I I, I bring this out in the book that prayer can be not just something that we say, it's something that we do, right? It can be the way that we posture ourselves, our bodies, right? And we can pray in that way. But prayer is reorienting and therapeutic, you know, in the sense that, you know, if we look at what is the human condition, the human condition is currently one in which we are disfigured by our disobedience in the fall. And prayer is certainly, along with almsgiving and fasting, that action that reorients and refashions and right orders a human being, right? Um, And so it puts us into that dialogue. Um, It gives us access uh, to God in a way that, you know, other actions and activities don't. 
and it allows God to work on us. Some people say, you know, if we get into that idea of faith and works, some people say that prayer is an unwork. <laughs> it it takes apart um, perhaps our wrong thinking. And, and not to throw something totally enigmatic out there, Hank, I would say that prayer allows for the connection between the heart and the head, you know, and allows the head to descend that, that, you know, almost impossible journey that we hear about in the saints, you know, to move the head into the heart and to pray from our hearts, you know, eating into prayer allows that descent and that activity to occur. What do you see as the heart of the soul? <laughs> um, the heart of the soul, I think it's to know, if you will, the way of Jesus. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure in Hank, in that question, sometimes it's a little bit confusing because, you know, of course, the, the teaching of the church involves, you know, the, the idea of the noose, right? I don't know if you're going in that direction. That's the direction I was going in, yes. Yeah, so, so we could say that, you know, the spiritual literature of early Christians um, incorporated this idea that there's an, a, an eye or a, 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 an eye of the soul, a, a lamp. Um, you know, that can be lit inside the soul, that can illumine the soul's path. And St. Paul uses that language. It's just that we often read that language in a translation, and so we don't see his use of the word noose, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the eye of the soul. And that noose can be um, darkened. Jesus uses this language, right? He, he talks about the eye of the soul. And if it's clear and it lets the light in, then the soul can apprehend and know its creator and can also know what God has intended for humanity. But most of us live with a darkened eye to the soul because of our sin, because of our neglect of the relationship. We've forgotten our, our Lord. We've forgotten our first love, as Revelations 2 puts it. And so that's, that eye becomes clouded, and, and therefore the direction of our life gets off. You know, our matia, we start to miss the mark, you know. I really look at these disciplines as therapeutic, right? Uh, they, they heal humanity's disfigurement. They put us back into a right, ordered way of living. You know, you mention prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I think a certainly... Uh, as an evangelical, the pattern of prayer is more focused on what you also noted. We pray to Jesus, but mm -hmm. but 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 when we pray to God, we're praying to one God revealed in three persons, eternally mm -hmm. distinct. We're not speaking to a Unitarian God. No, we're, we're speaking to a Trinitarian God. And what's interesting is, uh, if God were Unitarian, absent <laughs> the universe. Uh, he would be morally defective because yeah. without the universe, without the creation, he would have nothing to love. Right. Uh, love always requires an object. Yeah. So mm -hmm. a Trinitarian God is a God that manifests the attribute of love. There are love yeah. relationships between yeah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and we can enter into that love relationship. Uh, I don't want to get too far off the point the point being, what's the distinction and how important is the distinction between praying solely in the name of Jesus and praying in the name of the triadic one? Well, I mean, I think for me, as someone who grew up within um, the church, I, I never heard prayer that wasn't Trinitarian, right? So I can recall being a teenager and going to um, a church that uh, my dear friend John invited me to, and hearing prayer only in Jesus's name, I was I was struck by it because I thought, well, isn't God always in communion, you know, with, you know, the Father, the Son, the Son, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Father, right? This divine community, and as you said, God would be you placed it in the phrase morally defective if he did not have a creation to love, right? I mean, I think for the Orthodox, you asked me earlier, what is prayer? We could say prayer is an act of love. And love is the basis of relationship. 
And God himself is a divine community of three persons, right? And so God is eternally in prayer because he's in a language of love. Uh, the, the, the Greek there is uh, perichoresis, um, maybe translated as a mutual indwelling dance, right? There's this divine movement. So when we say, um, you know, how does God act in the universe? The answer what the church would give is to say, well, God always acts as community. He always acts Trinitarian. You know, the, the crucifixion was a Trinitarian act, the baptism, the resurrection. There's never a point in which the Father is separate from the Son and the Son is separate from the Spirit, right? So to me, I think if we're going to enter into the dialogue with God uh, through prayer, then we acknowledge the reality that God himself is a community. And so it would make sense that we would invoke the name of the Trinity in our prayer, right? It's sort of like walking into the room and, you know, let's say I come to your house and and you and your wife are in the room and I exclude your wife in my greeting, right? I'm sure your wife would be gracious and say, oh, he he's not being um, rude or, or, or uh, uh, in some way, I guess, uh, ignoring me, but it would be wrong of me to ignore that your wife's in the room. And so it is in prayer. We, we need to acknowledge. Now, that's not to say, you know, like we know the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner which can be done with breath even. And that is directed solely at Jesus. Or we have the prayer of uh, the Holy Spirit, oh, a heavenly king, comforter, spirit of truth, right? Uh, and that's directed at the Holy Spirit. But you'll notice that contextually in prayer in the church, we are never then remaining only in a direct address to one person of the Trinity. We always move beyond that, right? So I just think that it it makes sense that that's how we would address God, always Trinitarian, right? This is the way that Christians always prayed. And another aspect of prayer that most people are familiar with is going into a mode of prayer and then whatever comes to mind, <laughs> yeah, whatever thought is in your mind, you now direct toward God. Uh, in my own prayer life, I've always learned to pray, um, well, certainly as an Orthodox Christian, I've learned to pray first and foremost with the Jesus prayer. Lord mm. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. Sometimes, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy me, uh, on me, a sinner, for thou alone art worthy now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. Um, and, and, and in my prayer time, that always begins, uh, initiates my prayer. Yeah. Uh, later on, I, I, I pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Mm -hmm. Then I express my faith in God, my adoration for God. Mm -hmm. I confess my sins and oftentimes use Psalm 50 or 51, yeah. depending on whether you're talking As about Heretic, God. Greek, right. Mm -hmm. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love and so forth. And then uh, I, I express my thanksgiving. And, and only after that do I bring my, mm -hmm. my supplications. Mm -hmm. But you're also pointing out in your book that that's one way of praying, but there's more to it. And you're underscoring the importance of using a prayer book, Yeah, uh, praying in liturgical fashion. Yeah. And I'm really interested in you explicating that for our audience. Well, you know, I mean, we can take it at the most basic level. You know, when the disciples ask the Lord to teach them to pray, he gives them a prayer, right? You you just read it <laughs> in Matthew 6. Yes. He, he doesn't say, well, whatever's on your heart or whatever or wherever the Spirit leads you, he gives them a prayer. And if, you, if you're close to the Greek of that prayer, you, you notice, you know, if you're studying scripture in the original, you notice that that Greek there, maybe this is the wrong word to use, is a bit, quote unquote, stilted. It's, it's a liturgical cadence. You following me? Yes, I am. Yeah. And we also know, let, let's just say this, that um, there is another version of the Lord's Prayer. Luke. Yeah. And if you look at the Greek, they're not even close right? They're not even close. 
So, so today, you know, if you ask any Christian to say the Lord's Prayer, they're going to say the one out of Matthew. No one says the one out of Luke. No one. It doesn't matter where your Christian walk has led you. You all say, every one of us says the prayer out of Matthew. So that kind of gives you an insight to the fact that Christianity was praying liturgically from the start. It was what the Lord taught, and it's what the, the, the Christians did. And we know that early Christian document, the Vivace, right, stipulated numerous times during the day in which we would recite that liturgical prayer, right? Then we think about, you know, just kind of, you know, continuing this explanation. Then we think about, well, what was the prayer book of, of our Lord? And we know it was the Psalms. Right. And we and we know that the early church utilized the Psalms. This was the prayer book of Israel. And that if we if we really look at the 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 worship of the apostles, it was steeped in the Psalms. Right. And and then we could even go beyond that and say they even would assign certain psalms to certain hours of the day. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we have that vision of Peter that he he um, the book of Acts tells us about while he's praying the hours, right? And so we know that there was this liturgical form of prayer that Peter himself was following, even as a believer in Jesus. He wasn't just praying, contempt, you know, sort of in a contemporary or uh, off-the-cuff way. Mm -hmm. We can go even further and say in the in the book of Acts, we know that they continued in fellowship and tes prosyafies, right? The prayers. So there was these set prayers. So so liturgical prayer um, is part and parcel to the Christian story. It's it's there from the beginning. It's in the scriptures. It's in the early experience of the church, and as Christians, in gathering in prayer. We would hear prayer in the worship, the Eucharistic assembly, that was liturgical in its structure, that fit a pattern. You mentioned a pattern that you utilize, that had a structure, that was biblically based and sound. You know, for example, when we pray and we petition God, the scriptures teach us to pray for our enemies first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we then found in liturgical prayer. Like if you look at written prayers. Now, as, as Christianity um, develops, right, the church in an attempt to really, and this isn't in the book, but we can, we can talk about this. The church wants to assist and support prayer that is both communal, you know, the gathered body, and private, you know, in in Matthew, you read from this the portion of prayer in our closet, <laughs> secretly before God. Mm -hmm. That's private prayer. But we know Paul admonishes Christians who are neglecting the communal and corporate prayer, right? So, so Christians, I think today are often disfigured in this, Hank, aren't they? Right? They they may only go to church, <laughs> and and not pray at home, right? So they just go to church and pray, but they don't pray at home. Or vice versa, they may pray at home, but they don't go to church anymore, right? There's no need to go to the assembled body. Well, liturgical prayer sets the cadence for both the corporate and private act of prayer. For no Christian is above the body, right? Um, we stand within the body. You know, the, if, the language in Ephesians is helpful here, right? Uh, about how we're part of the body. So so the compilation of prayers into a prayer book was a resource that the church developed naturally so, um, providentially so, to assist Christians in their private prayer, which then assisted them in their corporate prayer and vice versa, right? The, the two feed and help uh, instruct the other. If private prayer doesn't occur, the corporate worship suffers. If corporate prayer doesn't occur, private prayer suffers, right? So they're 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 both working with each other. Um, I think one of the points though that 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 I'm trying to make in the book is that we're impoverished when we ignore 
this biblical, historical, Christian principle of liturgical prayer when we're just in our own heads, in our own hearts. And it's more likely that we can become disfigured in our prayer. We can get off track. Now, I'm maybe not answering the question that you asked, but... Um, no, you did. You, 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 you did answer the question that, that I asked. And, and I love the expansion on, 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 on the importance of communal prayer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so much of the Christian life oftentimes is lived individualistically, but yeah. Christ is building a body, as you alluded to in Ephesians. Um, I, I want you to elaborate a little bit on uh, the little church and the big church. Um, you've had a great impact on some of my family members uh, through this book, because now in our little church, in other words, our home, uh, some of my kids have their own prayer corners. And, you, yeah. and, and, and you've given us a lot of insights on how to set up that prayer corner. <laughs> also, how to go into that prayer corner. So yeah. if you're praying early in the morning, do you walk in in your underwear? Yeah. Um, no. You also gave us insights with respect to bodily postures. Now yeah. I could go on, but I, that, that, that's enough for right now. Uh, elaborate on that, the importance sure. of, of, of having a prayer closet, as it were, in your own home or a prayer closet corner in your own home and and how you set that up and 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 then how you reverence god by the way you go into that Space. state of prayer well okay you know we know in genesis chapter 12 that god invites abraham to get up and go to a place that he will show him and i'm aware that it's abram there and later will become abraham but for ease of of use you know nevertheless god's going to show Abraham a place. He's going to take him somewhere, right? And then, of course, we see throughout Scripture the, the importance of places, Bethel, Shechem, Jerusalem, right? Um, and then, of course, we know the admonition of the Lord that, you know, he's not contained in a particular place or space, right? Um, which allows me to open up a little coda, which I think is pretty interesting. You know, that prayer, Hank, earlier we, we spoke about related to the Lord's um, Holy Spirit, right? Oh, heavenly King Comforter, Spirit of Truth. Uh, it, it goes on. Present in all places and filling all things, come and abide or dwell in us, right? That abide or dwell, eskinosin is the Greek. It's related to the tenting of Israel in the wilderness and God's meeting in, in, the, in the tent of meeting, right? It's also related to John 1.14, the tabernacle, right? God literally can set up within him and within us a place of meeting, right? A meeting place. Well, because we are a psychosomatic, psihi soma, we are a soul and a body. We we can run the danger in our modern Christian walk of becoming Gnostic hmm. and ignoring the importance of the body. And, and even a modern evangelical who may cringe at the idea of setting up a prayer space, right, is, is if you will, not totally Gnostic, because they, they may even just at least fold their hands or, or bow their head or maybe go on their knees. They may feel like the Bible itself is not something that they could throw on the ground and step on. Right. There's something sacred about that text in and of itself that God has imbued that text with his presence. Right. And it's a it's a sacred thing. It's a sacred object. So so in terms of the prayer space, big church, little church, if you walk into um, an ancient church, an Orthodox church today, um, you notice that the church is set up in such a way that you orient yourself spiritually. Mm hmm. And that orientation is really beneficial. And that orientation actually begins from the moment you walk in. Mm -hmm. And then this, we'll, we'll talk about how this translates to the small church at home. So Orthodox churches typically faced east. That was traditional. Now we know that's the direction of the city of God, Jerusalem. But it's also the direction Anatoli. It's the direction from which the sun 
rises. And we know early Christian language played with S-U-N and S-O-N, right? The sun, right? And what's to the west? The west is the direction that the sun sets. It's the direction darkness comes from. So when I go into a Orthodox church, I put my back to the darkness and I face the light. John 1, right? And then the first action as I walk into the big church is I go to a, in in an Orthodox uh, setting, there's a narthex, kind of a, a vestibule, right? And there's even in some places an exonarthex, but we don't need to go into that. But we go into the narthex and what do we see? There's a candle stand. And I go up to that candle stand and I don't take a candle and a lighter out of my pocket and light it. But rather, the light is already lit. The light of Christ is there, and I receive that light, right? And I place my lit candle next to the faithful who've gathered, and the light grows. Two or more are gathered, right? The light grows. And then I move towards the altar of God, and eventually in the liturgy, I will go to the altar and receive the actual body and blood of Christ. Now, that prayer space, that orientation, there's more to say. In the wisdom of Christianity from the time of the apostles, we took that experience of the big church and we said, let us make sure that that experience is also in the little church. And so let it, let's orient ourselves in our daily prayer facing the light. So the same thing. We place our prayer space, our prayer corner, our home altar facing east. Let's put our backs to the darkness. And let's place in that prayer space a lit, many people use just a, a simple seven-day candle. More ancient tradition is to use an oil lamp. And let's recognize that orientation and that importance of a space. And then, and then let me jump here. Right now in our pair study, we're looking at Luke 11. And Hank, if you recall in Luke 11, there's this confrontation basically between Jesus and the Pharisees and the scribes about where does his power come from to cast out this demon? And they say, well, it's from Beelzebub. And then he says, well, if, if that's where my power comes from, then where do your sons and <laughs> derive their power, right? You know, where are they getting it, right? And a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, what I want to get out of here is that Christ is inviting us to consider that when I show up, the forces of darkness, evil, will recede. And I will establish for myself there's no neutral ground, a place for the light and the life that I give to humanity, right? So if our churches are claimed for Christ, in our homes, by placing a prayer space, an altar, we do the same. We claim a space where Christ is present and the darkness is pushed back and there's no neutral ground. We are claiming our home for Christ. And so then when we're setting up that space, you know, we've already mentioned the light, a lamp, a candle, maybe a vigil lamp, uh, an oil vigil lamp. I would then say, because it depends on people's level of comfort, Hank, you know, if someone's listening to this that's not, let's say, in the Orthodox Church, they might say, well, okay, I, I can go with a candle maybe. <laughs> I would push it and say, well, could we put a cross? I think that's fair. Could we place our Bible there? Because I think reading our scriptures in a prayer space and praying our scriptures is, is important. Um, if we're willing and able, we could place an icon of the Lord. And if someone is like, well, where do I get one? You could go to Google Images and you can type in Orthodox icon of Jesus and you'll, you'll get one, the lover of humanity, and you can print it and place it there. Perhaps you're ready to place icons of his mother, the Theotokos, the mother of God, maybe some of the saints or the feasts of the Lord there. And so then we start to arrange a space and then we can even mark the space, not only with beauty and order, 
Um, this goes back to Genesis. Am I am I am I joining on too much here, Hank? I'll... No. I, in fact, I think what 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 you're saying is is so incredibly helpful. And as you're just talking, I was thinking. I don't want to get you off your your your, your track because I think it's very instructive. Uh, I, I really want people to have this sense of how to set up mm -hmm. uh, a, a prayer corner in their little church in their home. Yeah. But I, you know, when I was, I went through a four year battle with stage four mental cell lymphoma. When I was in the hospital, I set up a, a prayer corner in my, my room mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people would come, whether it was a doctor or nurse yes. or the person that was cleaning the floors or whatever, they would come into my room and they would feel as though they're walking into a chapel, Amen. a, a holy space. Yep. And, 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 and when I left the hospital, so many people came into that hospital to say goodbye to me and, and, and told me about the transformational nature of walking into that sacred space. Amen. Yeah, you've claimed, you've claimed a space for God. Just like we see, you know, secularly, we claim spaces for evil. You know, if, if you go into a bar, if you go into a strip club, if you go into a casino, the imagery there, the setup is all designed to move you towards sin, towards disfigurement. And a prayer space is designed to do the opposite. And, and you know, I, I, I give a challenge every year in my own parish. And I'll share it with your listeners. I call it the Alios Discipline. And that is to purchase and tend to a vigil lamp in your home from Matthew 25 and the parable of the five wise and the five mm -hmm. virgins. And people will come to me afterwards and say, Father, tending that lamp changed my life. Mm. Again, we're psychosomatic. You know, what occurs in the body occurs in the soul. What occurs in the soul occurs in the body. That's how we're designed. And the fall, we get fractured. And the body starts to rule. It becomes sarks, right? The flesh in Paul it starts to rule the body. I mean, rule the soul. And the spiritual disciplines reorient us and place the soul and the spirit on top and no longer at the whims of the body. And tending to a vigil lamp, a holy act, will help in that orientation. Now, what I was getting at about filling and ordering space, going back to Genesis, you know, I think it's the second verse, first chapter. You know, what's the problem? The problem is disorder and emptiness, right? And then God goes about placing order. He separates the waters, right? He pulls up the dry land and then he fills, right? And then what does he do? My chief steward, who's made in my image, whom I've breathed life into, will now be in charge of filling and ordering my creation, right? That's the command he gives us. So a prayer space is, in a way, connected to that initial commandment or instruction of God. Fill your space and order it, but according to my commands, right? So we, we set a space, and as you did in your hospital room, we claim a space, and it all of a sudden orients and orders people and fills people. Because unattended space gets filled, mm -hmm. right? Yep. 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 You know, I mean, the, the man who's possessed by a demon, the demon leaves. The space is empty and swept. He gets seven more demons. They fill him up. So we're all possessed. It's just what are we possessed by? So by saying, well, I'm going to set up this prayer space with a cross of the Lord, with the light of Jesus Christ, perhaps icons, a prayer book, a Bible, maybe a prayer rope, you know, that'll help me as I recite the Jesus prayer. These are tools that I can use in this life. This will call me to prayer. And like Abraham, I will get up in the morning or I will go to my bed at night and that prayer space will call to me. You know, mine, mine is oriented so that I can see it from my bed and I can't get in and out of my room without going by it. So I, I, I am called to it all the time. Now, you, you mentioned some of the physical aspects of prayer, how we go to our prayer space. I think it's important that we go to our prayer space clothed and in our right mind. This, <laughs> this we can take up from the, the interaction Jesus has with the gathering demoniac, right? 
after his healing, he's found to be clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. So we go to that space in that same orientation. We can think about being clothed in Christ, Galatians. Those who have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Enavisate. We are clothed in Christ. We put off the old person, the old man, the old Adam. We've been clothed in Christ. So we robe ourselves, right? We, we, we don't just go and let's say our underwear disheveled. We go before our God clothed and in our right mind, ready to be at his feet. And then what is the proper physical disposition? It's not sitting. I think that's, you know, that's a very common position of prayer. But if the Lord is present, we wouldn't remain seated, would we? (laughs) We're going to stand or we're going to kneel and we're going to lift up our hands. That's the that's the traditional way of Christian prayer and supplicate God. So kneeling or standing before God, we may even learn to do a prostration before God. Um, Hank, and I believe in the book I talk about its meaning, mm-hmm. right? Prostration and, and how that encapula- encapsulates the whole gospel. Fallen, but redeemed and able to stand upright. You know, the prodigal son imagery. You know, he's in the pig pen, but he arises, stands up. And then standing or kneeling before God, we recite our prayers. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Let me let me just say, this doesn't mean, and as you mentioned, that the prayers of my heart or the prayers placed on my heart by the Holy Spirit are not prayers that are excluded, but they're not the sole means of my prayer and the only way in which I pray. They're included in the structure of liturgical prayer that the Lord taught us, right, and gave to us. I think one of the things that you're highlighting here is the significance of whom we are praying to. Amen. We're talking about the one who spoke and the universe leapt into existence. We're speaking about the very one who knit us together Yes, in our mother's womb, uh, the one who is on the one hand ineffable, on the other hand knowable. So yes. I, I, I think we can become all too cavalier. Yes, and and treat God like uh, you know. Friend. I saw a T-shirt Friend. the other day. This 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 uh, bloods for you. You know, it's it's just a cavalier attitude toward uh, the one who sustains all things by his miraculous power, the one who resurrected from the dead, the one who ensures our resurrection from the dead. And that leads me to another question in this regard. There's a phrase that recurs over and over again in your book, and I've seen this phrase other places. It's 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 not unique to your book, but you give it a unique quality uh, by using it again and again in, in, in just a very, very, I think, um, effective manner, the phrase matter matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, our salvation, you know, God, God could have saved us any way he wanted to, right, Hank? <laughs> He's God. But he chose to save us through the incarnation. He took up matter right? And he worked with matter. And then we look at just creation itself and we say, isn't it something? God took the dust of the earth and out of it fashioned humanity and breathed his spirit into it. And this unique combination, mixture, blend, those words are used in the ancient Christian text, is unique in the universe, unique. So much so the angels marvel, right? It says, you know, Paul goes into this in Hebrews. It's it's incomprehensible to them, (laughs) right? That humanity should have the spirit of God in matter. And of course, you know, Christianity emerges in a context in which, you know, for the Greeks, matter was a trap. Right? Matter was profane. That's why you burned a body. Mm-hmm. You, know, so you could release its spirit. In, in, in sort of many Near Eastern religions and cultures, matter was cyclical in a sense. You know, you were, you were, 
you know, if you were the Egyptians, you know, it was just this unending circle and, and, and the spirit really, uh, uh, it doesn't have a real part to play in the human person's existence. Right. But in, but in this Christian expression, we say humanity is unique, that it is both body and spirit. This was God's will and his intention. And his will and his intention was that that union was to exist forever. Yep. Right? We know through our disobedience and our soul sickness that we broke this union through our disobedience and our breaking of God's commandment. So then how amazing, <laughs> how humbling that God's solution is to send his son, his only begotten son, into creation, and he will take up the human condition, and he will become the theanthropos, the God-man, and he will reconcile matter and the spirit in himself. And we see that in his ministry, matter mattered. The blind man is sent to the pool of Siloam. The woman with the flow of blood touches the hem of his garment. Um, and this even continues in the Acts of the Apostles, the shadow of Peter, the handkerchiefs taken from Paul, right? They continue to work through matter. The Lord instituted the use of bread and wine, you know, parts of this physical world that have been refined through humanity's participation that God then transforms into the body and the blood, you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, you know, this bread, which we break, is it not the body of Christ? This cup, which we drink, is it not communion in the blood of Christ? You know, more on that on 1 Corinthians 11, but we do damage to the gospel. We do damage to the salvation that God has given to us in his divine economy when we ignore matter. And that was exactly what the early heretics were trying to do. I mentioned them earlier, the Gnostics. They, they wanted to ignore the body. They said it was not to be part of the Christian walk. Yet fornication, a physical act, Paul mentions, so separates us from God that we cannot join the body if we are joining this body to a prostitute. Right? He, he mentions that in last week's epistle. So matter matters. And so what we can do with matter is we can pray, we can fast, and we can give alms, right? St. James mentions that, doesn't he? You know, if you ignore the needs, but say be warmed and filled, <laughs> somehow you haven't quite really filled the gospel out. And then we see, you know, this might be hard to all follow, but then we see after our Lord's resurrection, 40 days later, he ascends into the heavens and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He takes matter into the kingdom. Th there was, if you will, no matter in the kingdom until Christ brings humanity into the kingdom. And so then we have this prayer in the church. We say, oh, Christ, our God, stretch forth thy hand from on high and bless the food and drink of these thy servants. There is a hand in heaven. <laughs> it's attached to the body of our Lord and Savior. Right. And so matter matters. And uh, we'll be reunited with this body in the general resurrection. Right. Yeah. God does not. He does not dispense with things. He redeems them. And we, yes. we, we, we think about the physical resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we are going to arise bodily. This body yes. that dies is the body that rises. Mm -hmm. Uh, the universe that groans and travail will be liberated from its mm -hmm. bondage to decay. So God, again, doesn't destroy things. He redeems them. And so matter really matters. I want to move into almsgiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, very, the very use of that word is, is kind of unique. A lot of people are not familiar with the word alms. What mm -hmm. is the significance of that word? Well, for me, it's an act of love. Um, let, let's take for a moment the last judgment given to us in Matthew 25, verse 31 through verse 46. 
We know this parable as the parable of the sheep and the goats, or perhaps the parable of the last judgment. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the parable? Well, we're told that the Lord's return will be likened unto a shepherd who comes and then separates his flock, the sheep from the goats, the sheep to his right and the goats to his left. And to the sheep, um, he says something uh, that is repeated to the goats, but just antithetically, <laughs> right? To, to, the, to the sheep, he says, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink and on. And then the sheep say, when? right? They're, they're not aware uh, of this. And then he says, well, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. But I want to focus on the, the, the sort of response they have when. Their actions were not dictated on a list of do's and don'ts. Their actions were not dictated in a morality their actions were not dictated out of fear of judgment. Their actions were dictated out of their desire to give alms based in love. So almsgiving is an act of love between one person and another. And it connects us in a way that makes us truly brothers and sisters and the action is, if you will, incarnated in the true believer. So almsgiving is ultimately not something we do. It's something we become. We just become lovers of humanity like our Lord. And it's the natural response that we have. You know, it's How not can we cultivate that natural <laughs> response? Because... You know, there, we, we live in a very impersonal or depersonalized mm -hmm. uh, culture. You know, if I want to support um, a leper colony in India, I can write a check. Yeah. But I don't have any intimate right. communion with those lepers. I was just in India and I was in a leper colony and I had the opportunity to feed lepers and, yeah. and interact with them. You know, the, the physicality of that almsgiving... Or it is not tangential. It's, it's, it's not insignificant. It is axiomatic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We talk about in the book how, you know, there's this passage of the Good Samaritan. And in that passage, we hear of a person going from Jericho to Jerusalem, and he's beset or attacked by robbers who beat him, rob him and leave him to die. And we're told that a certain priest and then a certain Levite pass by on the other side and do not tend to his needs. And then a Samaritan, we don't have time to go into all that means. I'm sure you do plenty of the times in, in the way that you, you exegete scripture. But a Samaritan goes by and the text says he had compassion and he went to him. The Greek is is really powerful there. It literally means the noble part of his inward being felt the pain of his brother. His guts. His guts. But here, Greek is very precise. It doesn't just mean like the colon and the intestines. It means the noble in innards, the liver, the kidneys, right? It's it's the nobler part of ourself feels the pain internally of our brother, of our sister. And if you look at the, I mean, I would just tell your listeners, go look at the icon of the Good Samaritan. It's really instructive. So you'll see the, the man <clears throat> on the side of the road, beaten and stripped. In the distance, you'll see two figures, the priest and the Levite. And then the Good Samaritan is depicted as Christ, who is with the man looking at him, touching him, the point you made earlier. He's not off in the distance. There's a direct connection. He's not, if you will, above him. He's not behind him. He's 
with and beside him, right? And so almsgiving is, again, it's therapeutic. It, it restores us to a right way of living, and it helps us to see that unlike Cain, I am my brother's keeper. And I feel that, that stewardship in myself. Now, you asked, how do we get there? Because we live in an impersonal <clears throat> world. We may not be in a position where we really do practice almsgiving. Well, we may start in a sort of construct. We may say, I'm going to go donate time at the local food bank. I'm just going to go down there every Tuesday from 10 to 11 when they sort the pantry. And then maybe after a couple months, I'm going to work the food line. And, you know, when the homeless come in, you know, maybe they don't smell great. Uh, maybe, maybe they're not sober. Maybe they've got challenges with their emotional or mental state. And so maybe in that third part, I'm going to go sit and eat with them. And then maybe I'm going to learn their names and their stories. And I'm going to remember those names and those stories. Maybe I'm going to invite them into my church. Maybe I'm going to invite them into my life in an appropriate way. And I'm going to have a direct connection. Now, let's just say this biblically. St. John Chrysostom is riffing off of the scriptures when he says, the rich have the poor and the poor have the rich for their salvation. And in scripture, we know that our unrighteous mammon is redeemed by our giving to those in need. And the poor will stand at the throne of God and will defend the rich and call them as friends. You know, the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the problem is that Lazarus doesn't know the rich man's name, right? The rich man never got to know him. I think that story would have turned out different if he had knew who the rich man was and could say to Abraham, no, get the water. That's Tom. I know him. He helped me, right? So I think starting, starting you know, maybe woodenly, also, you may think, and I, I talk about this in the book, perhaps you have a talent or, a, a, or or something you like. I think I talk about, you know, maybe you like horses. So you could go donate time at the local therapeutic riding center, or maybe you have a gift with numbers, and so you can do tax returns for free. Or there's ways that we can utilize our talents, our interests, you know, to, to start becoming a person of generosity who eventually doesn't even realize what the left hand and the right hand are doing, right? That, that this is just who we are, like going back to that parable of the, of the last judgment, you know? Um, and so our oil is in our reservoir of oil is full. This is again, Matthew 25 in the parable of the five wise, five full, uh, five foolish, that when the, the bridegroom comes, our lamps are lit and we can go into the, the heavenly banquet, right? One of the the issues you bring up in your book, and I think admirably so, is uh, the issue of toxic charity. <laughs> yeah. Elaborate on that. Well, toxic charity, I think, generally operates under the understanding of hierarchy. You know, I am in a position to help you. And I'm better off than you are. And you have something to gain from my interaction with you. That's pretty toxic. Hmm. There's a lack of identification of the co-relationship between the donor and the receiver. And that's why the icon of the Good Samaritan is so helpful. It's looking eye to eye. It's standing side by side. You know, in the Orthodox Church, we have a, a sacrament that we use for reconciling sinners called confession. And if you've gone through the, the sacrament, you notice that the priest is not standing up and above or behind, he's standing beside, right? And so toxic charity, if you look at it sp spatially, places us in a position of hierarchy. Another thing that toxic charity tends to do is it tends to operate from a place of assumptions. 
You know, so we come into a situation and we operate in such a way that we actually do damage to those that we're attempting to serve, right? And a lack of understanding is usually derived out of a lack of love. If I come into a situation and my compassion moves me towards a love of my sister or brother, then I come to an understanding of who they are and what truly their needs are. And then I can act based on that understanding as opposed to just dumping money, dumping material goods, right? Um, that often can be maybe hindrances to their own growth, could be uh, destructive to their culture or their way of life. They could be disrespectful to their personhood. I, I had an opportunity to, to work with a group that was doing work amongst the poor in inner cities. And it noticed that all of the charity work led to the greater absence of fathers. Mm. Because fathers were emasculated in the process. So the, the, the organizers realized we need to give the fathers a way to regain their place in their families. Because when we show up with all these presents on Christmas and we give clothes, they somehow are emasculated because their role as provider has been taken away from them. So they stopped donating items directly to families, instead invited the dads of families who were in need to come to a store where they could purchase at greatly reduced prices the needs and gifts and desires of their family. And all of a sudden, dads were starting to be around in that ministry model. So there's, you know, there's some investigation and, and sophistication to understanding how we avoid toxic charity, but we've got to be aware of it. Yeah, we do have to be aware of it. I, I wonder before we move on uh, to the, the, the third leg of the stool, um, uh, speaking about fasting, uh, we, we, which is a multifaceted, beautiful aspect right. of the Christian life. I wonder if you can just help us maybe viscerally understand what it will be like for each one of us when our heart stops beating mm. and we're in that circumstance uh, that you describe from the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 25. We're standing before the Lord of the universe. And now whatever we had in our bank account doesn't really matter uh, how popular we were, how famous we were, or maybe the inverse, really doesn't matter. We're standing before the Lord of the universe and giving an account of our life. The reason I want you to elaborate on that is probably not as much for your audience as, as for me. I, I remember so distinctly um, facing my own mortality uh, and, and, and thinking, Lord, have I done enough for the least of these? And the words that you quoted from Jesus, if you've done this for the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And, you know, at, at that point, it's not going to matter that I had a, a big platform in this world or, or had the trappings of success. It, it, it only matters what Jesus thinks. It only yeah. matters what the triune God thinks yeah. Yeah. of what I did with the time. Uh, I well, spoke on this earth. You know, in answering that question, we, we are so greatly aided by the liturgical calendar of the church, which ordains for us and sets in front of us certain biblical concepts at certain times of the year. So as most Christians around the world would know, we are entering the Lenten journey, right? Which will culminate in our celebration of our Lord's victory over death and sin. Most call that victory Easter, and in Eastern churches, we call it Pascha, right? Which I would argue is the better term, right? It's, it's the biblical term. Uh, nevertheless, in an Orthodox setting, we don't enter that season without first hearing the gospel of the last judgment, right? Well, and. Right. That reading precedes. So the way I look at it is I, I tell my parishioners, I said, let, let's say you're going on a journey 
and you're packing your backpack, the church, as you're leaving for the journey, goes, wait, we got to stick four things in your backpack. <laughs> and the first of those is the reading from the publican and the Pharisee. And we learn, you better have humility because all the prayers and fasting and giving of alms without humility will not make you justified in the eyes of the Lord, right? So that passage from Luke, the, the, the publican goes home justified because of his humility. The second thing that we shove in that backpack is the idea that you have a loving father whose love is so great that no matter your sin or the distance in which you have gone from him will receive you and is looking for you, right? The prodigal son. The third thing that we hasten to stick in that backpack is the parable of the last judgment. That if you lose sight of just all the things that you just mentioned that we can lose sight because of, my popularity, my money, my looks, my my job, whatever. But you have not lived the criterion of love for the least. You are going to be in trouble on that day of judgment. And here, I think the false arguments of faith versus works, I think we can just, you know, let's just shove them all off the table and say that when the Lord speaks about the last judgment, he talks about, have you loved? And has your love shown up in feeding, giving shelter, clothing, visiting? It's, you know, it's very Matthew because it's, you know, <laughs> listen and then go out and be my hands and feet in the world. So now I said we're very, be we benefit from this sort of liturgical rhythm. We then go to the next Sunday. The last thing that we shove in the backpack is Forgiveness Sunday. You know, the idea that we must forgive our brothers and sisters from our hearts if we expect to be forgiven from God. So we've packed those four things. And then you go through the journey. And on the week before we celebrate Pascha, the first three services are called the Sunday or the, the it's the Sunday matins, Monday matins, the matins of the bridegroom which is a self-applied term that Jesus uses for himself. He calls himself the bridegroom. And the central passage is again from Matthew 25 about the five wise and the five foolish virgins who go out to meet the bridegroom and he is delayed. This is a parable about the second coming. And as he's delayed, they all fall asleep. And then a cry goes out, the bridegroom is coming and they all awake and rise to trim their lamps. But the five foolish find that they did not bring enough oil, and so they cannot light their lamps. So they turn to the five wise who've brought extra oil, and they say, can you give us some of your oil? And they say, no, we cannot. You'll need to go into the marketplace and acquire oil for yourselves. And while they go, the bridegroom arrives, and the five wise go in, the doors are shut, and the five foolish are closed off from the bridal chamber. Unfortunately, some people say, well, why do those five fools not share with the five wise? And the answer, if we know the text, is in the text. What is the Greek word for oil? Eleon. Eleon. That's olive oil. That was the fuel that people used for their vigil lamps. What's the Greek word for mercy? Eleos. The five foolish have to go back into the marketplace and show the mercy that God has asked us to have on those less fortunate than ourselves and have a rich store of oil. So no matter how long they're delayed in waiting for the bridegroom, they've got enough oil to get through the night. So that's why I said to you earlier, I, I challenge my parish every year to have a vigil lamp because you have to replenish the oil drop by drop, just as your you ask, what's it going to be like? I have to have a rich, rich store of mercy. So much stored up through my life. Acts of mercy towards those are less, who are less fortunate than myself, that I have more than enough to get through the night to meet my bridegroom. And the church, it's plain as day. It's in our liturgical calendar. You cannot help but go through it. And so it has to impact you and how you live daily so that you're ready. Because the whole purpose of the church is get us ready for the day 
when that last heartbeat occurs. So we can meet our judge and have a good defense. You keep mentioning the liturgical calendar. And, yeah. and I think that's such an important emphasis because there's a rhythm to our yearly life yeah. when we yeah. follow a liturgical calendar. And we're uh, yeah. constantly brought face to face with those things that really matter, not just for time, but for eternity. Yeah, because I can skip the parts I don't like, but if I don't control the calendar, right, it's 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 in front of me. And, you know, for anybody who gets weirded out by that term, I would just say, look, every Christian lives a liturgical calendar. It's just some people's calendars only got a couple of events on it, you know, Christmas <laughs> and Easter. And, and the rest of us may have a calendar that has all the events of the life of Christ placed in our path so that we can walk each year. You know, someone said to me, um, you know, why is it that you guys repeat everything? And I said, well, once you have the perfect model, you don't come up with something new. You just repeat it, right? If you have the prototype, we just keep trying to build the model in the likeness of the prototype. So our, our liturgical calendars, it's really simple. It's just we walk through the life of Jesus every year. Again. And we don't just make that up. It doesn't no. come out of whole cloth. I mean, it's the, the, you mentioned the Didache earlier. Um, the, 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 I, I noticed you made the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Well, there is a pattern that has been passed down to us from the apostles to the apostolic yeah. fathers mm -hmm. to the pre and post Nicene. So, what was believed everywhere, always, mm -hmm. and by all has been passed on to us. And that's what we're seeking to yeah. emulate. Yeah. Well, you know, Hank, it's interesting because in, in Scripture, when the word tradition is used by St. Paul, it's almost always used in a positive sense. And he uses the Greek word paradosis. And that is something that we receive, we guard carefully and pass on to the next. It's sort of how the modern court system works with the chain of evidence, right? Right. You log it, you keep it intact, and then you carefully transmit it. So as you rightly said, these understandings, these rhythms, the cycle, prayer, the way we do our almsgiving, all of these things have been established by Christ and the apostles and then not just preserved, but lived generation by generation. And, and it's all there for us, right? We don't have to reinvent it. You know, we can receive it and live it. Let's talk about fasting. Okay. What is fasting and why do we have to do it? We're, we're entering, as you mentioned, the Lenten it's season, <laughs> and there's a lot of fasting going on. Yeah, there well, is. And, 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 and there's a, a, a connection between fasting and feasting as well. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, in the book, you know, the book is not near as complicated as our conversation. By the way, you're, 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 the, the conversation is illumining. Uh, oh, I, I don't think yeah. it's complicated at all. I think it's okay. very illumining. But, but I, I have to say, just before you answer my question on fasting, this book is available for those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can get your copy for your support of this ministry on the web at equip.org, or you can write me at box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. Uh, this is one of those books, uh, I, I probably won't tell you how my, my son characterized this book. Um, not in a demeaning fashion at all, but he said, Dad, you got to read this book, and it's not going to take you much time. Nope. And, 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 and that's one of the beauties of this book. It's comprehensive, but you can get through it very, very quickly. And it leaves an indelible mark on your life. Uh, again, this is a book that I highly recommend, and it is available uh, through the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. Check it out on the web at equip.org. Uh, back fasting. to fasting. Hank, I got to tell you something that you're just going to laugh about. So when your son dave reached out to me about coming on the show and and you wanting to talk about my book this is just completely an assumption i made i i have a new book that came out in november 
And so you 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 haven't seen it, but but I had all these notes ready for my new <laughs> book. I thought, oh, okay, Hank's going to talk to me about this new book I have. And then when you started your intro, I went, oh, he's talking about the first book. <laughs> So I had to enter this conversation cold turkey, you know, I was like, uh, it's all geared up for the other book, but, um, so fasting, it's interesting. And we don't think of this, I think enough. The first commandment God gives to humanity is fast. He hmm. says, do not eat. First commandment. For the tree of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Do not eat. He gives us a fast. The first temptation of Christ is break a fast. They're in the wilderness. And the devil says, turn these stones into bread. So if we think fasting is not central to the Christian life, central to the gospel story, all we've got to do is look at where the scriptures began and where the ministry of Christ begins. Both of them begin with a fast. Wow. Okay. Now, going back to this idea that the human person in the fall becomes disfigured, we lose our orientation, Hank. You know, we would say in the garden before the fall, man is walking with God. And this is also a way of saying that man is in communion with God. There's no separation between him and God. And that man is rightly ordered before mm -hmm. God. And then in the breaking of the commandment, man's right orderedness or righteousness, his ability to be clothed in the glory of God is lost. And he becomes disordered and fractured. That's why Paul talks about, you know, how he does the very thing he doesn't want to do because he's disfigured and disordered. And how is he going to get out of this mess? Jesus, right? So Jesus shows up and Jesus takes our fallen humanity, he doesn't take some other humanity, and he connects it again with God and lives in obedience to the commandments of God, right? And it's not a parlor trick. He's fully human. So the temptations he goes through are the same temptations you and I go through. And in every way, he's like us, save sin. He never becomes disobedient. He never loses communion with God. He never misses the mark. So he's the perfect human, right? And so in Christ, we see that humanity's fractured and disfigured state is reoriented and reintegrated. And so anybody who has a, a teenage daughter, and I don't mean to pick on teenage daughters, I have had three of them. How many of you had, Hank? You've had a couple of <laughs> I'm at 12 total, but yeah, yeah, yeah but seven and few, five, yeah. Right, yeah. A few, a few teenage daughters. You, you, I mean, this is a little bit of a joke. You can see how the body or the flesh has taken over. You know, when, they, when they're getting ready, what are the number of hours that it takes for them to get ready? You know, and you'd say, are we in prayer that much? <laughs> Do we give that much attention to fasting? So in a way, like all of us, the body has taken primacy and, and the flesh and its desires rule us. And if we're not careful, they'll dominate us. So what does fasting do? Fasting places a bridle, places, it circumscribes, it cuts off the source of our insatiable appetites, our connection to the world. And it gives space, more than anything, it just gives space. You know, think of the image of a python that's just eaten a, you know, a small animal, and you see that animal in its gut, you know, well, while that big meal is sitting in its belly, let's say, that python can't move, right? And humanity in the same way becomes immobilized by our appetites, hmm. right? But fasting quickens the noose, purifies it, illumines the spiritual senses. I remember as a young priest, one of my mentors said to me, 
Remember, Father, whenever you're going into spiritual battle and ready to hear the confessions of your people, fast. Be ready. Because your adversary can play more tricks on you when you're full than when you're empty. What I mean by full of the material life, right? So fasting allows us to restrict the appetites and give us a level of obedience again, because what's harder to control my thoughts and my words or whether I need or not I eat a piece of cheese? Well, anybody who knows anything about human life would say, well, it's easier to control whether I eat cheese. But from learning the obedience of disciplining my appetite with cheese, I can then graduate to the discipline of guarding my thoughts and my actions, right? I, I move from the lesser to the greater. And as God sees that I'm faithful in little, he'll grant me, right? According to my faithfulness, he'll grant me more, right? He who's faithful in little is faithful in much, right? That's the... the, the there's something you say in your book in this regard. Um, uh, if I can paraphrase, is it possible for someone to go directly to the heart of spiritual discipline? In other words, is it possible to go directly into the battle of conquering lust or pride or anger? And you say, yes, it is, but, but I've never, ever seen that as a priest. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like saying, you know, is it possible to run a marathon tomorrow? But I've never seen anybody who's never run before get up and do it. Yeah. You know, so, so yes, fasting is this gradual increase of spiritual discipline that makes it possible for us to approach specific sins. Now, you know, one of the stories I begin the book with was meeting a gentleman who had been a Christian all his life and read everything you could read, but it told me, but I don't know how to pray, you know, and I've never fasted, you know, I've never really worked at a, at a place where I'm encountering the poor. And so by talking about fasting, you know, again, the Lord talks about it. He doesn't say if you fast. It's when you fast. Yeah. When you fast. Right. We know that the Lord wants and encourages us because he knows it will help us spiritually if we fast. And then the church doesn't leave us sort of guessing what that fast looks like. You know, using the wisdom of the apostles, we we lay out a course for the fast and how we fast. And, it, you know, in the book, Hank, I talk about different types of fasting. You know, there's these fasts of seasons like Great Lent. There's the fast of Wednesday and Friday for the betrayal of the Lord and his crucifixion. And we shouldn't for a moment think, well, Christians weren't doing that in the first century. They were, right? So we're just continuing in that. There's the fast of the Eucharist, you know, the fast that we have of total abstinence of food and drink and of sin. St. John Chrysostom is quick to add that. We're not just fasting from these food items, we're fasting from sin. But we then fast from these things in order and completely to have the meal of the heavenly banquet with Jesus, right? Um, and let me hasten to say this, Hank. You know, none of these disciplines in and of themselves um, should be practiced solely by themselves. They are part of a three-legged stool. And our almsgiving is connected to our prayer, which is connected to our fasting, right? And so St. John will say, the food that we fast from should find its way to the plates of the hungry, mm -hmm. right? So fasting is also connected to our almsgiving in a very real way in which we reduce our budgets and then turn that over um, to those in need. Yeah, you know, why we talked about prayer and no one's going to push back on on the mm -hmm. need for prayer. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we talked about almsgiving, and we viscerally know almsgiving is important. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be a lot of pushback when it comes to fasting. In the mm -hmm. contemporary church, boy, what are you into? Some weird, occultic, mm -hmm. monastic practice? What's going on with you? What's this hang-up that you have with fasting? 
Well, I mean, usually when I'm when I'm countering that, you know, I'll I'll talk to them about the fact that the first commandment, as we mentioned in my opening remarks, was to fast. And the first temptation that Christ receives is to break a fast. So I'll say, well, you know, if you're going to ignore the Lord's battle with evil and his desire to overcome it through fasting, go for it. But if you're going to follow the Lord of glory and be obedient to his teachings, then you are going to follow and emulate his life. And he then in another place says, you know, when the bridegroom is taken away, in that day, my disciples will fast. So the bridegroom is taken away from us in the sense that he's been crucified and ascended. And then he comes to us in the time of the Eucharist. So this rhythm of fasting and then feasting, you mentioned that earlier is was built into the christian lifestyle right and then as as you've as you pointed out earlier matter matters what we do in the body impacts the soul you you cannot tell me that that if i sit in my house and i gorge myself in rich food and drink a ball of wine that i am not going to be more inclined towards sin it's just true and the lord knows it because he built us. And he knows that if in similar way, we we rein in the passions and the appetites, then there is room for us, a room inside of us for God. We're not so full with the, the, the appetites of our flesh. And then sin becomes less likely, right? So, so you know, look, don't fast at your own peril. That's what I would say. No. And the and, and the liturgical calendar really teaches us to mm -hmm. fast because it's constantly brought into the center of our focus. Yeah. Uh, we we mentioned the Lenten fast. Maybe you can talk about some of the the major fasts of the church. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, we, we mentioned the Lenten fast. Uh, it, it's essentially a vegan fast for for forty days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit more than forty days, unfortunately, because <laughs> you add in Holy Week. Um, and then we've got other elements of fast where we we slowly graduate from, you know, not having meat products and dairy, right? But nonetheless, your point's well made that we've got these seasons. There's four of them. There's the season of the great fast, great Lent, uh, which begins for Orthodox Christians on clean Monday, for uh, Catholics on Ash Wednesday, and goes all the way um, unto the Vespers of Lazarus. That's when the Orthodox end the Lenten fast. And then we have a two-day feast uh, celebration, uh, raising of Lazarus from John 11, and then the triumphal infantry of the Lord into Jerusalem on John 12, and then we have Holy Week. The second fast comes at the conclusion of the, of the Paschal season. So we, we celebrate 40 days to the Ascension and then 10 days to the Pentecost of our Lord and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then afterwards... In the month of June, typically, there's the Apostles Fast. It sort of helps us to recognize the movement of the church into the apostolic era and into the world, right? And it culminates with the Feast of the Apostles at the end of June. At the beginning of August, we have a two-week fast known as the Little Lent, um, the Feast of the Dormition of the Mother of God. It, it commemorates her falling asleep in the Lord. And it's, it's two weeks long. And then a fast that probably most Christians are somewhat familiar with is the Feast of Advent uh, that precedes the celebration of our Lord's Nativity. That begins on November 15th. In addition to those fasting periods, only one of them will vary in length. And that has to do with, that's the apostolic fast, it has to do with the movable Feast of Pentecost. You know, it does, it's not, doesn't come every year on the same date. Christmas does, December 25th. Pentecost moves because it's based on the date of Easter, Pascha, right? So that fast can get a little bit shorter or a little bit longer depending on where Pentecost hits. Nevertheless, to that, Christians have always added, as I mentioned already, Wednesday, the day in which our Lord was betrayed, and Friday. Those are also vegan fasts. Then we add into that certain feast days, 
that are fixed. August 29th, the day in which the forerunner of our Lord was beheaded by Herod and was murdered. That for Christians has always been a solemn day of prayer and repentance as the prophet of God was, was martyred. So it makes no sense if you understand your life in Christ that you would be feasting on a day in which the greatest of all men was martyred, right? Um, the Feast of the Cross is a, is a, is a fixed fast on September 14th. And there are several of those. And then we can speak of the fasts that accompany the reception of the Holy Eucharist. Um, those are total abstinence, usually beginning the night before one receives the Eucharist and culminates with the reception. In other words, if my meal is going to be the meal of the Lord's Supper, what could I possibly take in that would be more important than that or more filling. So Christians always held themselves from any food or drink prior to the receiving of the Eucharist. And then we could say, Hank, not often mentioned are fasts that may be prescribed by one's spiritual father, dependent on whether or not someone has a particular sin that has dominated them. So if I have, let's say, a young man who's really struggling with the sin of lust, I will often give them, in addition to the fasts of the church, typically a fast of water only, or water and some food, to help cure them of their slavery to, to um, sin of lust. And again, like you said earlier, some would say this just sounds like self-masochism. It sounds like some esoteric monastic practice. Look, this is what Christians have been doing since the first of uh, the hearing of the gospel in, in and around Jerusalem. This is nothing new. I'll elaborate on this a little bit. Um, the, the, the point that you're driving at through all of this is that if you become an Orthodox Christian, you are embracing a way of life. Yeah. It's not about going to church once a week. Um, it, it is embracing an entire way of life, and that way of life orients you mm -hmm. toward what you will experience for all eternity. Which is to say that we are uh, we, we are setting a pattern, uh, a pattern of theosis. We, we, it's not about a punctiliar uh, kind of mm -hmm. a faith, a point in time. It's about a process. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, theosis actually uh, continues on in eternity. We'll continue okay. to learn and grow and develop, albeit without error. Mm -hmm. We're always moving towards an unreachable goal. God yeah. is ineffable. He is not knowable in his essence, but we can know more and more about the very God that saved us by, by his grace. And, 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 and so you're talking about setting up a practice which yeah. will continue on for all eternity. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about this process, you know, we know that God is the only person who can say I am, right? Every one of us is in a state of becoming, mm -hmm. right? We're all in process and we will be in process forever, right? So we will go from glory to glory if we are on the path of our Lord's heavenly kingdom. You know, we will become a child of light and each and every, you know, it's hard for us to, you know, we, we think in a linear fashion because of the fall, we're constrained by, you know, Kronos. But we know that God lives in Keros. He lives in, you know, a, 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 a time that is not marked by past, present, and future, but only present, right? He is. And so, as you're saying, when we enter into this transformational life, these disciplines that we take up are not disciplines that we take up for just a time. Rather, these are the elements of our journey for eternity. And 
we are constantly going to be transfigured and transformed into the likeness of God. And 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 it's almost like if if we were Christians, we would say, okay, if I'm if I'm secular, I think of lo- of life as a timeline. I'm born, I die. That's it. Blackness on one end, blackness on the other, right? Before I was born, nothing. After I die, nothing, right? If I'm if I'm tied into maybe some of the pagan or Near Eastern religions, it's maybe more of a circle, right? But if I'm part of the the Christian story, it's it's maybe more like a spiral. I'm going to constantly move, maybe like Philippians, you know, Paul saying, you know, not considering what I have accomplished, I press forward, right? So I'm always going to be moving, but I'm going to return, but not in exactly the same way, to these hallmarks, these benchmarks, these signposts along the way, right? So it isn't as if in the kingdom, and I think this is what is wrongly thought, maybe through the influence of Dante and others, that I'm going to get into the kingdom and I can just eat as much ice cream as I want. And it's like this big giant amusement park. And I can just pig out with no consequences. No. The disordered appetites in this life are ordered. The disordered way of living and the emptiness of sin is pushed out and set aright by Christ. And I practice by grace and by my participation synergistically in the in the message of the gospel in that. And then in the kingdom, as you said, now I'm no longer going to be tied to because sorrow and sighing and envy have have been cast off. But now I'm going to be still moving and growing, right? More and more into the likeness of God. I think C.S. Lewis does a nice job in his book, The Great Divorce, right? Of kind of giving us an imagery there, right? When he talks about someone being deep into the heavens and can't come back to the bus stop to see his relative, right? He's too far in, right? But the journey and the transformation and the ordering of our selves in Christ and through Christ doesn't stop. You know, um, and it's naive to think that they would. You know, the three-legged stool, um, prayer and fasting and almsgiving, uh, it, we can look at it on one hand as a austere discipline, on the other hand, sure. an enormously satisfying way oh. of life. When you embrace the pattern by which our Lord taught us to live, there's a deep inner satisfaction that you can't get by acquiring the trinkets of life. (laughs) The Greeks have a great phrase, Hank. It's called harmolipi. They call it joyful sorrow. Hmm. There's this sorrow that accompanies your loss of the things of the world, but it is replaced by a joy. And any Christian who's gone through this set of disciplines in a real way will often tell you as they exit Holy Week, I'm saddened to lose the fast. I'm saddened to lose the extra emphasis on prayer. I'm saddened to lose the extra emphasis on giving of alms. And what I always tell them is that there has to be an exit strategy. You you can't just drop it all off on Bright Monday which is what we call the week, the first day of the week after Pascha, Bright Tuesday, but it's called Bright Week. We have to, if you will, kind of imagine a rocket ship and it breaks out of the orbit, right? But it doesn't stop. Now free of the gravity and the pull of the world, it is now propelled into the heavens. And so we think of the exit from Lent and we take some element of this new discipline of prayer this new discipline of fasting, this new discipline of caring for those that are poor and in need with us. And the monastic communities are helpful because we see in them that they retain a greater level of those orders in their daily living, you know, which we in the world may find challenging to keep, but some element stays with us. So that's that spiral again. 
So we get to the next Lent and the next Lent, and we're not in the same place. We're a little further, a little further, right? Father Evan, you have enriched my life, and I'm sure you've enriched the lives of uh, many people in our audience. The book, A Toolkit for Spiritual Growth, A Practical Guide to Prayer, Fasting, and Almsgiving by, again, Father Evan Armitas. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh -huh. Yeah, thank sort you. Sort of? And, yeah, Armitas. That's how it's, I have okay. an uncle who pronounces it Armatas. We always tell him uh, he's wrong. Armitas. Okay. And, uh, you know, you certainly fit the profile of our ministry. We, we're looking for people that are interesting, informative, inspirational, and you fit all three of those categories. The book, again, available for those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can get your copy on the web at equip.org. You can also write me at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. And uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. It helps a lot. Uh, I am deeply grateful, again, for the contribution that you have made. Uh, you're not only a, a fabulous writer, but you're a great communicator and uh, inspirational to the max. I mean, I am inspired by this conversation. Uh, I, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Hank, let me uh, say this, that uh, I said before we got on together that, you know, your ministry has definitely enriched the members of my community. And there are people who have, you know, followed your ministry, your life in Christ for many years. Look, as you said, when we get before the, the dread judgment seat of our Lord, you know, any of the accolades or the nice things people said will matter nothing, right? All that will matter is what our Lord thinks of us. Um but I'm thankful and grateful that your ministry exists. Uh, I truly mean that. And um, so many people in my community have been edified as a parish priest. That's important. And I hope it's not wrong for me, Hank, to say that uh, I hope the book will give glory first and foremost to Jesus Christ, that it will draw people to him, not to anything else, that will lead to their transformation and their life in Christ, and that they then because of what they've received and that pearly great price will go out and share it with others. And if you'll allow me to say it, um, my second book kind of takes up on that idea. Um, and I hope some of your listeners will be interested in that book as well. It's a little different. I am writing a toolkit book too, which should come out in the next year or so. But my latest book is focused on reclaiming the great commission. Ah. Oh. Yeah, I've got it. Like I said, I thought this was the book you were going to be talking to me about. No, um, but that's a book I'd like to talk yeah, about. Yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah I, I mean, I think this whole this whole issue of uh, going out and making disciples of all nations, mm -hmm. teaching them whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm mm -hmm. with you always, even to the end of the age. This this idea that we are called to enlarge. Yeah. Uh, that 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 we are called to bring people into the circle of fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's so important, and it is so often neglected. I'm involved in a mission that uh, is establishing churches all over the 1040 window from West Africa oh, to East Asia, and and you see these first generation Christians, and the one thing that's so yeah. contagious is they want to bring others. Oh yeah, to find the food that they found. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, it's, you know, not to go too far afield, and I know you've you've been gracious with your time, and we've gone a little bit over, but I'm always struck that almost every service in the church ends with a call to the Great Commission. And it's interesting, in the baptismal service, after one claims Christ for themselves, the priest exclaims, quoting from Paul, Blessed is our God who desires that all people should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Yes. And so, you know, I, I wrote this book because I think that our parishes need to reclaim that evangelistic prerogative and directive to share the gospel with more and more. And so, you know, this book, A Roadmap to Parish Health, was, like I said, I thought, oh, I had all myself all prepared. I thought, oh, this is what he's going to talk to me about. But I'm really happy to talk about the first book, um, especially with Lent beginning uh, Clean Monday, just right around the corner. Well, thank you again. And thanks, 
everyone for tuning in to this edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast. We look forward to seeing you next time with more of the podcast. So long for now. <laughs>